Welcome to episode two of series two of LD's Pivot to Performance and the second of five conversations. As with series one, Guy Wallace and myself, Dave James, will be speaking with esteemed guests about their own pivot from learning focused practice towards a performance orientation that more predictably and reliably, let alone efficiently and successfully, achieves demonstrable results for both employees and organizations. For these five conversations, each two weeks apart, we've invited guests that have made the pivot themselves and have achieved real results from doing so. We'll invite our guests to share their stories, we'll question them on their approaches and encourage them to share relatable experiences to inspire you to either initiate or enhance your own pivot. We'll also see plenty of opportunities for you to get involved too, but perhaps we should start with some introductions, including our own pivot from a learning focus to performance focus. And Guy, if you don't mind, I'll go first. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm David James. Um, I have been involved in learning and development for the best part of 25 years. I'd say that 15 years uh, of that were in in-house roles where I was members of learning and development teams and then uh, led uh, country and then region-wide uh, L&D teams. Most interestingly, perhaps, is uh, the time that I spent at Disney, uh, where I was director of learning talent and organizational development for the EMEA business. Um, I spent uh, uh, eight years there uh, and it was uh, it was a hugely valuable time. And I think it was at that point uh, in which my own pivot uh, began. Uh, prior to that, I spent seven or eight years mainly in classrooms uh, and building out uh, uh, learning and development teams, providing training and de-learning. Uh, but it was at Disney where the conversation really changed for me, when people stopped necessarily just asking for uh, for programs and content are more about actual change. And so my pivot came when I realized that when I'm being held accountable for entire countries to be ready to, to perform differently or integrating different functions, then we needed to ensure that we had, we're very clear on the outcome. Uh, and we lent much more on mini accelerated apprenticeships than we did on any traditional training or learning. So that's when uh, it really uh, occurred to me that uh, that performance was, uh, was was what we should be aiming for, and I've spent my time since on making sure that digital lands and affects performance because I think too often we accept that um, that the provision of online content is enough, uh, and uh, and I think that uh, that we're uh, hopefully we're moving past that point. But that's enough about me, uh, Guy. Uh, would you like to uh, kick off with an introduction to yourself? Yes, thank you, David. Again, my name is Guy Wallace. I think I'm one of the lucky ones in that I was. Uh, began my journey in a performance orientation to learning and development, uh, training and development back in 1979 when I joined a small training organization and they were adherents to the methodologies of the late Gary Rumler, Tom Gilbert, Joe Harless, and Bob Mager. Uh, those people are no longer with us, but they've left us with plenty of uh, practices and processes that we can employ in making our own pivot to performance from just learning content. Um, I've been a consultant since 1982. I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I'm happy to do this series again with David. Um, I, I'd like to turn now to our guest, Dr. Carl Binder. He's been a hero of mine since the 1980s when I first met him at NSPI which is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance and Improvement. Carl is the CEO of the Performance Thinking Network. He was one of the last graduate students of B.F. Skinner at Harvard University. Carl has published dozens of articles and chapters and books and presented dozens and dozens of times at workshops and presentations at conferences. He is the recipient of two of ISPI's highest awards, the Thomas F. Gilbert Award, and the Honorary Life Member Award. He's also received the Fred S. Keller Award from the American Psychological Association for his work in education. And he's received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Organizational Behavior Management Network, a sub-discipline of ABBA, the Association of Behavior Analysts. Carl, what have I missed? Please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you, Guy. It's really nice to be here. I got to say, it's been a mutual uh, whatever. I've treated, I've viewed you as kind of a hero myself because I think you've made more of a contribution to spreading the word and getting information that's useful out there than anybody I know. So thank you for that. Um, I don't think you really missed anything. I think the the large, the, the sort of the 
the, the big picture is I started out as a, as essentially a behavior researcher, a behavior scientist with Fred Skinner. And then I lived and worked in a, in a laboratory for about 10 years where we had laboratory um, research on learning. But we also were working with severely disabled people in institutions for much of that time and other special populations where if you didn't have effective instructional systems, they didn't learn anything. Unlike a lot of us, which, you know, we can learn despite lousy instruction. And I spent 10 years doing that with a focus on what we call behavioral fluency, which is, which is essentially the effect of practice, becoming quick and easeful in performance, which is what we really need to do to, to define mastery. But then in about 1980, one of my main mentors, Og Linsley, said, I want you to take what we've learned and move into business. And so I moved into sales and eventually customer service and a whole lot of other areas. But what I discovered, of course, is that you can do fantastic training, which we did for salespeople. But if you don't arrange the other conditions in their world to support the application of that, it's not going to work. And so I got introduced to Tom Gilbert's framework, the behavior engineering model, and his focus on accomplishments about then. And I also got introduced to ISPI about then. And uh, that really took me on a journey with all of those thought leaders that you mentioned, learning from them and then applying uh, what they taught me or what I learned from them with a special emphasis on using plain English to make it accessible to as many people as possible, which is kind of the, at the core of a lot of what I do now. Well, thank you. So that was your personal pivot then, uh, mm -hmm. working in the sales arena and uh, tr seeing that instruction or learning wasn't always uh, sufficient to right. make the change. So let's let's skip ahead here to uh, you probably likely refined your approach since those early days. Um, could you share with us some of the highlights of, of what works for you? And, and mm -hmm. then we'll dive in a little bit deeper in just a few minutes. Okay, well, a couple of the highlights were uh, I and my, the teams I was working with, and we were involved originally with banks who had been deregulated, and so they had to create salespeople. They'd never sold stuff before, and now they could. And then I got into customer service and other areas. But what we, I loved Gilbert's book, and uh, like many of us, read Human Competence. And in particular, I loved his behavior engineering model because it put all the variables, all the things that we need to put in place into this simple context. And so I and my team members would use that as we thought about what else do we need to do to support learning in the field and application and so forth, beside just effective instruction and practice. And but but the first sort of bump was that when we started to partner with our clients and stakeholders, the language in Tom Gilbert's model didn't communicate very well. People didn't understand what that meant. And so we started, like a lot of other people in the 80s, um, some of our other colleagues, started tweaking the language, but we took a very user testing approach to it. And we wanted to have plain English language that pretty much anybody could understand without making category errors. And so that evolved during the 80s until we got the model we now have. And a few years later, I was struggling with it because people said, I would say, well, this is from Tom Gilbert, but it's obviously not his language. And, da, da, da. and finally, one of my clients at Dun Bradstreet said, why don't you just, you're always talking about those boxes. Why don't you call it the six boxes? So we did. And we started using that as part of consulting. I've had four consulting firms. And so we were, we were using that with our clients and they could engage. But then over from probably about 2005, when we realized we had a thing that we could teach other people in a useful way, we've been refining how we teach it and particularly the focus on accomplishments, how we teach people to identify and define accomplishments to which we would then apply uh, you know, appropriate behavior in the behavior engineering model. So it's been the last 15 years has just been a refinement with people that we teach and coach through projects. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's let's go deep on this. So the behavior engineering model, you've converted that to those known more popularly as the six boxes. But there's mm. other aspects of your methods. And right. and can you share with us and, and, and take us a little bit deeper in all of that? Sure, absolutely. So. So what we now always say is we have two simple visual models and 21 plain English words. And so what we recognized, of course, and, and it's in a certain way, it's a downside because the six boxes model people love and you can do really good work with it, even if you don't use it fully, you know, because you're identifying other stuff that needs to be put in place. But the point is 
you need to define performance first. And I think I probably learned more from Joe Harless about that than anyone else. But we began to really focus on how do you identify accomplishments? And the word accomplishments is a great word. Um, Tom Gilbert is the one that introduced it to me because it sounds valuable and all that. But two things about it. One is, uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, it more frequently means the completion of behavior than it means the thing that the behavior produced. And secondly, if you look in our field, at the literature, at presentations, people mean a lot of different stuff with that word. They mean sometimes big business results. Sometimes they mean small things. They mean all kinds of stuff. And so we we developed this very simple model, really kind of flowing out of, 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 of uh, Joe Harless's work, where we said the elements of performance are behavior that produces accomplishments uh, that contribute to organizational or societal results. And you can't really define performance without those three elements because you don't know the context. So we started with that. Uh, but then we also coined the phrase work outputs. And the reason we did that was to sort of cut through the confusion about what accomplishments might mean. And there's two things about that. One is it sounds like the product, the behavior, work outputs, right? And the second thing is it's plural. And so one of, if, if there's one thing that I've sort of insisted on, and I think it might be one of the only real technical kind of refinements that I've added, it's the notion that, that an accomplishment has to be a countable thing. It has to be a countable noun is what we always say. So for example, information kind of sounds like something I give to someone else, but what is it? I want a report or an update or a data set or whatever, a thing that I can then look at and determine what we call criteria for a good one. What makes for a good report, a good proposal? We also expanded, we, we developed a set of words really based on pragmatic experience about how do you look for work outputs? And you know, obviously they're deliverables. There's things like widgets and documents, but things like relationships are also important accomplishments and you can define what a good one is in any given context or transactions or um, uh, decisions. A lot of people think of decisions as behavior, but they're really products of behavior. And so we expanded kind of this, this set of words to help practitioners have conversations, observe performers, and extract or find outputs, both in individual performers or the performance of a role, uh, or in processes, which are the usual two places that we kind of look uh, for, for performance. So that's that's been refined over the years. And we also... We're, I'm a nitpicker. I'm always telling people that I'm like a fifth grade grammar teacher because because when I look at a description of a work output, I want it to be a noun. I don't want any verbs in there. And I want it to be countable. Or when I look at behavior, I want it to be an active verb that's easy to understand what it means. And then we have criteria for a good work output, which are the characteristics of that output that make it one that's okay or acceptable or what have you. So we work really hard on that. And what I've learned is that that's the hardest part for people that we humans are used to, maybe not precisely, but talking about and looking at behavior, but we're not so accustomed to looking at accomplishments except real tangible ones, things like deliverables. So we work very hard on that. And once people identify the work outputs in whatever the hunk of performance is, it's a lot easier to then go after the behavior and figure out using the six boxes what we need to support and improve to support that behavior. So that's kind of how it's evolved, if that makes if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So uh, you, you're talking about accomplishments or work outputs, but then tell us a little bit more about the six boxes. And and okay. uh, for our audience, since this is an audio, uh, yeah, can you right. frame it first and then Absolutely. talk about the cells in there? Yep. So so following Gilbert, the six boxes is a a matrix that has two rows and three columns, and it actually evolved from Skinner's three-term contingency, which was basically antecedents or discriminative stimuli, behavior or responses, and consequences. And so Gilbert developed this notion that is beautiful, which says there's things in the environment that influence behavior. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, he had different names for them, but we say there's expectations and feedback. There's tools and resources, which is a really big sell because there's, that's not just like tools it's process design, work design, it's having people, it's having time, it's having ventilation, it's all that stuff that supports performance. And, and job aids, by the way, documentation. And then, and then consequences and incentives, which are not only the things that are formally arranged to recognize and reward 
uh, you know, appropriate performance, appropriate behavior. But there are also the unintended consequences, of which there are many. If you have a bad process or a lousy piece of software that punishes doing the right thing, then you got a problem and you got to fix it. We also emphasize something that's maybe a little bit different than some people. I'm far more interested in arranging all the other conditions so that people make contact with the natural positive consequences of their performance than arranging sort of external consequences. I'm fine with rewards and recognition and, you know, compensation and all that. But what I really want to do is enable people to competently, fluently, easily produce the accomplishments that are important and sort of feel good about that, frankly. So the top row then is expectations and feedback, tools and resources, and and uh, consequences and incentives. And again, following Gilbert and Peter Dean and some other people who've looked at this, roughly 80% of the leverage are in that top row. That's really what makes a big difference. And then the bottom row is the individuals. And so we say there's skills and knowledge uh, that somebody either already has or we need to enable. And notice it's not the training box because you can get skills and knowledge a lot of ways beside training, like hanging out with somebody who's really good, you know, shadowing somebody, using a job aid, et cetera. Then we have what Gilbert called capacity. And he meant the individual capacity that we kind of identify in you to match you to a job or a task. And we call that selection and assignment because people understand what that means. It's the whole process of being sure you got the right person for the job or the task or the role. And then finally, we have a Tom called the last cell motives and we call it motives and preferences but we put in it a little subtopic of attitude because we, we, two things one is we've learned especially as a manager leader for example we need to understand what people's motives and preferences are so we can arrange the other behavior influences accordingly i think gilbert started out just thinking about is how we be sure that the incentives are actually reinforcing or rewards for people but we've kind of expanded that because it also affects how you like to get feedback. And there are cultural differences, for example. Um, uh, you know, if I've done a lot of work in South Korea. And if you if you call out an individual in a meeting as having done a good, good work, that's embarrassing because it's a collective culture. So whereas in America, it's like, yeah, it's me. You know, so there's different different things about that. And then, but the other thing that's been important, and it's a whole other topic that we probably go into in detail, is employee engagement. Because what we observed is that if people are very clear on expectations and they're getting pretty good consistent feedback and a lot of it's positive and some's corrective, they've got tools and resources, if they're getting recognized for doing the right thing, they're moderately well-skilled and have the right knowledge, if you put them in the right roles, they'll probably be happy campers and they'll stick around. But if that stuff's all screwed up, if it's misaligned, if it's negative, if it's, if it's out of alignment, then you can't do much to fix that person's attitude other than rearrange the conditions for their performance. So, of course, recently in the kind of big, you know, uh, what's called the the, uh, the great resignation, um, people are having a hard time holding on to employees. And we think arranging all those conditions systemically is a really important uh, solution, if you will, to, to keeping people around. So that's some of it anyway. That's a little bit more depth. Well, well thank you for all that. And so... I think it was important when you talked about the knowledge and skills and, and you know, learning and development organizations that produce learning mm-hmm. content have a role in that, but that's not the only means right. to that ends. And so there's a, within your whole model set, there is a place for learning and development professionals to kind of focus, but I think it's really important to understand all of these other variables mm-hmm. as that allows us to help clients uh, invest more wisely when when addressing a learning and uh, and, and uh, knowledge and skills issue isn't going to be sufficient. We can help them see the bigger picture and uh, what they might attempt to. Absolutely. Uh, let me turn to David and see if there's any questions for Carl from our audience. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, so I, I, I've got a question. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, hog the, uh, the 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 airwaves for uh, for a moment, but uh, but before I do, I will encourage. Uh, questions. I think that, uh, uh, Carl, there's a lot of information there. And I think that you're like, yeah. talking about pulling in um, the uh, the insights from uh, from uh, from some of the folks that have come before. Um, it takes a while to um, uh, for this to settle. And I think that when we um, uh, hear uh, about real examples, I think that, uh, that that we might generate some more questions. Mm-hmm. But but the question I've got, Carl, is I've got um, 
uh, uh, I love a bit of learning tech. Um, you know, it's you know that that comes from uh, first of all having to um, push dreadful LMSs full of uh, generic facile content, um, and then believing that there has to be a better way, uh, mm -hmm. and then almost making it my life's mission for the last eight nine years <clears throat> to actually yeah. do that. Um, but there are still messages I see from the market and and um, solutions that are bought that fly in the face of what you're saying. So there are there are platforms that say that you can learn skills in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do your analysis because the skills taxonomy, we've already done that research for you. And we know that these skills are missing in organizations like yours. So if your people do this generic content, then they will become skilled, right. which is so much easier to sell than what you've just said there. Yes. What's your position on that, Carl? Well, and please don't hold back. OK, I'll try not to. <laughs> it's not hard for me to not hold back on that. Um, I tend to aim that conversation around competency modeling, which is, you know, what people uh, which is sort of related, I think, to what you described. It's sort of categories of capability and the problem with competencies is they're inherently abstract because where mm -hmm. that all came from is doing an analysis, for example, of best practice behavior in leaders and saying, well, we've got 130 of those things. We've got to do something with it. So they sort them into piles and then they name the piles. And mm -hmm. so you come up with these things like strategic thinking or, you know, whatever. And, and the problem is, or communication effectiveness. Well, I'm sorry, that looks completely different if I'm speaking to a direct report that if I'm working with a tough negotiator, that if I'm trying to sell something, they're completely different behavior. There's some overlap, but not much. So if I have an LMS uh, that is organized that way, or if I have a performance management system that rates people on communication effectiveness, like, are you a four or are you a five, you know, then the level of abstraction is so absurd that mm. I believe it does more damage than good. I think the only good it does, and you hinted at that, is two things. For the vendors who are very good at selling LMSs and performance management systems, and by the way, we'll tweak, uh, you know, we'll tweak our competency model for you for a mere several hundred thousand dollars. And it also makes learners and talent development people and all those folks feel like they're doing something useful because they can address these competencies. But what I've observed is that you have an enormous – one of the reasons that people say most training is not applied is because it's too generic. And so mm -hmm. we can – if we can say, wait a minute, we don't need communication effectiveness. We need you to be able to respond to key questions in a tough negotiation that's likely to be these. We can go – and we can make it much leaner and more pointed and effective for people. So, so my criticism, I agree with you completely, and I've – you know, the competency modeling thing, the problem is that companies have been, have have invested millions, perhaps billions of dollars in these systems. And so I've spent a fair amount of time with chief learning officers, chief HR officers in companies. If you get them one to one in there in a room where the, nobody's watching and you say, how's that competency modeling thing working for you? A lot of them will kind of roll their eyes and say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it's really a mess, you know, and but we got to do it because that's what we have in place. And they'll give you stories like, well, you can't give too many fives because you got a grade on a curve or or we need to give you an opportunity for improvement. So even you're even though you're really good, I'm going to give you a four because we need to have some opportunity to be better next quarter or next year. It's crazy. This is not measurement. This is refined opinion, as one of my colleagues called it. So all of the ramifications of what you described, the sort of generic, whatever you want to call it, generic training and development, I think is just enormously wasteful. And I mm -hmm. think the ROI, the only people the ROI is working for is the people selling these systems to be cynical about it. You know? yeah. So anyway, we could do more on that, but that's, does that respond? Yeah, to yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, it completely does. And, you know, the reason, the reason I say that now is that I do think that uh, that the day of reckoning is coming for for learning and yeah. development because there are skills gaps, and if learning and development think that we're going to be plugging skills gaps with generic content in behemoth platforms without analysis, then somebody else is going to come along and solve the skills problem, the skills gap problem because it's necessary, and learning and development will be found out. But you know that's a that's another thing. But, you know, I've got one 
Yes, just call. Well, I was going to add something too, which is, of course, coming from the background with Gilbert and an accomplishment-based approach, what we're actively trying to promote is accomplishment-based talent development. Because if Mm -hmm. I define your job in terms of the outputs or contributions that you have to produce, which is quite easy to do, we do it every day, Mm -hmm. and it says you can do it on a single piece of paper and, and, and have a complete picture of a job based on the outputs of that job. Now I'm in a position to do hiring through things like um, behavioral interview questions and performance tests on those outputs. Have you ever produced a strategic plan before or a budget or have you ever had to deal with a tough relationship? Tell me about it. We can also do onboarding that way. We can say what outputs or accomplishments do you need to be up to speed on sooner rather than later? And we can stage onboarding over time. We can focus training on those outputs. We can do things like say, well, here's... Here's a milestone in a sales process, for example. New opportunities to, to, to you know, talk to new people in the account, let's say, is an output. Mm. Well, okay, what are some of the ways we do that? So you can zero in on the behavior, and maybe there'll be a skills need, but it's not obvious that there always will be with experienced people. The point is, if you focus on accomplishments, you can support people's ability to produce them. And then you can move people into an ongoing coaching process, which we have an accomplishment-based coaching program, that that addresses what you need to produce on the job, what you need to improve, um, what you might need for the next project or the next step in your career path. And so you can drive the whole thing with an accomplishment base as opposed to a competency base. So that's my solution to the problem. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I've got, I mean, so I've got one more question. We could either do this before or, um, uh, or, or after the next section, but I'll, um, but, but I'll throw it out there. Carl, um, at a very senior level, you know, your, your CLO, your CHRO, I can see why they would be talking with you about this. But right. within organizations, not a lot of people ask for this. And what learning and development people find, especially when they're more junior, is that the expectation is to run courses and, and provide e-learning. Yeah. Then later down the line, they realize that half of their job is trying to get clicks on an LMS that nobody's using. Um, and uh, and and seeking ROI where there's when it's impossible to do so because uh-huh. you've got solutions looking for problems. So yeah. how does somebody who is listening to this so they get it but they mm-hmm. don't know how to sell it start mm-hmm. selling it inside their organisations? Good, big, good question. We have a if you go to our well we have a, a YouTube channel called PerformanceThinking.tv and we also have our website PerformanceThinking.com where we have articles you can download. And one of the white papers we have, as well as the webinar, is called Get Out of the Training Box. And, mm-hmm. and it's really aimed at exactly what you described. And what we say is that classically training professionals are turned into order takers, as you well know. They say, give us the training and we'll handle the rest of the stuff. And usually they don't handle the rest of the stuff. And so the challenge is A, as a a learning and development professional, to learn enough so that I can actually address uh, other variables, other factors that influence performance, the other cells in the six boxes. But the harder part is to get your stakeholders to buy in. And so what I find is one of the, we haven't really talked that much about it, but one of the things about our methodology is it's plain English. It's very simple. People don't say, what's that jargon you're telling me? We can actually have an initial conversation with a senior executive or a training manager, anybody you want, and they can sort of get it about the elements of performance and the six boxes. So all of a sudden, we've got a communication framework. And then what we do, what we find in our best clients, where, for example, uh, one of the larger biotech companies in the world, where they now have over 300 people certified in our performance consulting methodology, is that it took, they've been doing this for a dozen years. And the first probably 18 months, they had to try stuff. And a lot of times people say, oh, well, sorry, we don't want you to do that. But then they would have a success and they would celebrate the success and they would do a kind of a viral thing where they began to show the stakeholders that they can make a big impact. So instead of their saying, just do the training, thank you, they'll say, you know, some of that stuff you were pointing to makes some sense. Come on back. Let's talk some more. So that's kind of a long term view. And my take on this is it maybe takes 18 months. But if you come in with a plain English, easy to understand framework as we offer. And then if you engage your stakeholders in this, some of them will get it. And that's one more point I would make, which is that when I'm selling my services or engaging people that I train about this, 
or especially when I'm helping to evangelize inside of an organization. So people say, oh, that's pretty cool. Let, let's do that. I'm looking for these aha moments. So when people, for example, see that anchoring our understanding of performance in valuable contributions, work outputs, accomplishments that people make, as opposed to the behavior, which who knows if it's going to pay off or not, when a stakeholder, manager, executive, whatever gets that, it's like, oh, that changes everything. We can measure that now. It's important. That's what's valuable. Or when they see the six boxes model and they say, yeah, you're right. You know, we can do the skills and knowledge thing. But if people's expectations are misaligned with what we expect them to do, it's and they don't have the tools and so forth, it's not going to work. So what I find is that if I can engage individuals where I can see, I can sort of see the aha moment, the light bulb going off. They see things, they learn stuff that they're not going to unlearn. And it may take a while for that stuff to add up. But there's some insights that people get about how this focus on performance really changes everything and makes it so you can actually improve performance, not just do training over in the corner and hope it works, you know. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Carl. If I can, I've, uh, you were talking about uh, skills and competencies, and it just reminded me so much of what Gilbert wrote about in his 1978 book, Human Competence, about the cult of behaviors. Yes. And of course, my, my shirt here has got the cult of performance on it. Uh, Carl, uh, could you give our audience an explanation of what is the cult of behaviors and <laughs> why did Gilbert uh, address it as he did? Well, of course, you probably know this because you've seen a few of my presentations. I always cite that particular bit because he said in the cult, great cult of behavior, you know, I don't remember the exact words, but people basically behave as though behavior was valuable in its own sake. But we must focus on accomplishments, the valuable products of behavior. Now, I was trained as a behavior scientist and I hung out with behaviorists for a long time. And we tend to get a little defensive because people, you know, for various reasons. But that's not who he's talking about. He's talking about everybody, pretty much training people, management people, everybody who says, oh, we need to change their behavior. And so I think what he means is pretty much everybody that touches performance at any level, whether a staff or a management leadership level, I, he's just saying pretty much all of us, we need to have a paradigm shift. We need to go from uh, the other thing that he said that you I know are quite familiar with. He had this sort of ROI formula and he used to say the worth of an intervention is equal to the value of the accomplishments that it helps people to increase or produce divided by the cost for the behavior. And I don't apply that kind of quantitatively. I don't insist that people do the numbers on that because you can't always do that. But as a kind of a perspective, you say, oh yeah, wait a minute, that makes sense. You can go through a whole training program that costs a lot of money to design, develop, implement, take people off the job. At the end of it, were they able to produce anything more of value? And a lot of times the answer is a little bit shaky. What we encourage people to do in the training and development world with design is we say your learning objectives should not be at the end of this, somebody will understand or know or even be able to do. We say at the end of this, somebody will be able to produce a better relationship, a budget, a widget, a requirements analysis, a whatever it is, a thing, an output. And if that's your objective, and you actually enable people to produce it, all of a sudden the value is pretty obvious, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, too often we're focused on the means instead of the ends and not yeah. seeing that skills or behaviors or competencies are a means to those ends. And we've really got to understand the ends, the work outputs mm -hmm. or accomplishments, whatever language uh, yeah. is appropriate in your, in your, in your context. Mm -hmm. Let's shift gears here a little bit. And, uh, uh, I'll ask you if you can give us a real life example of a problem that was presented to you and whatever analysis or discovery efforts that you undertook to understand and diagnose what it was that should have been addressed. Okay. Well, there's, I want there's two examples. I want one that both they're very different, but the first one only talk about is work we did in a call center and we actually published something about it at at t wireless years ago. And the challenge was they had to bring on a whole lot of new customer call center people because it was the it was the rise of cell phones. This was like in the early 2000s. And fortunately, I was working with a business unit manager, Lee Sweeney, who was a for, who was a, a basically an, a, an athletic coach by you know preference, and that's what he did. And his daughter was a volleyball player and everything. So he kind of understood performance. And the other thing is he did not want to bring the training 
folks in. He wanted to have his lead customer service reps basically do the training because they were also going to be doing the supervision. And the cool thing about that, it was sort of one of these things that comes together perfectly, you know, was that so often we have training people come in, teach people some stuff, then they go away and there's some other people who are supervising these people. Well, if you have the same people doing it, it means you can set expectations from day one. You can provide feedback from day one. You can get accustomed to this. You can be sure that the resource is in place instead of as a trainer, just leaving and hoping it all works. And so by definition already, we had some control over the whole system. But what we did was, first of all, we looked at the simple outputs that these people have to produce. Answers to questions, solutions, changes to the account information, um, um, you know, descriptions of the product options, very simple outputs that people had to produce for the customers that called them on the phone. And, um, and a lot of those were accessible by using systems, a lot of different systems. And so I always think of the customer service rep job as being, you know, you have to respond to questions and topics and issues. You need to be able to, while you're doing that, find a lot of stuff in a lot of systems and people might be yelling in your ear. So it's a pretty stressful world. And, and so in addition to that, we were bringing in from my previous 30 years of research, this whole notion of fluency-based instruction, where we would select those specific things that I just was pointing to, and we would define practice activities. So for example, you get two people together and you want to find out, you know, the customer's whatever account number. So you give them, you know, 40 names of customers and you put these people together and you say, let's see how many you can do in three minutes. And they get so they can find that account number in their sleep because they've got practice. So you build the fluent components, you give them job aids, you give them feedback and expectations, you be sure they know how to use the tools, and there are usually multiple tools. So you're basically configuring all the behavior influences as part of your training. And then when people leave the formal training, they're also still being supervised, in this case, by the same people. Well, the upshot of that was... Uh, you know, what we found, the t what, one of the things we found was when we did our analysis that, you know, one of the interesting things about the six boxes is all the boxes are connected. You can come up with, with, it's not just six lists. So for example, you give people a great tool, a piece of software, let's say, but they need to have the skill to use it. And so, you, you know, you have to do both of those things in order to make it useful. So we recognize that the usual ramp up time the full productivity of new people was often that it took a long time to get fluent using the tools because they didn't really have any focused practice to speak of. It was just like, go play around for 20 minutes and do a scavenger hunt or something, which is a very inefficient way to practice. What we found was if we focused on those skills for using the tools, plus some other question and answer type of stuff and other things, we were able to take what had been two months to get people up to benchmark calls per hour productivity and get it to two weeks. And then we were able to go beyond that productivity by about 60%. So as you can imagine, that sort of blew people's minds that we could make that much effect, but it's just because the usual approach is so inefficient. So that's one example, Does that if that is helpful. Yes, thank you. So can you, for our audience, define fluency? Because I, this is one of the things that uh, I really caught my eye mm -hmm. decades ago and uh, your mentor, Og Linsley, and maybe you want to mention well, him. And it actually goes back to Dr. Skinner because Fred Skinner described his major contribution. Most people think of Skinner's contributions as like reinforcement or whatever. But it was really, he said in an interview in 1968, said, my most important contributions were the use of rate of response that is count of behavior over time, and the use of the cumulative response recorder, which was a laboratory tool where you could look at changes in that rate of response from moment to moment. And so most of the discoveries that came out of Skinner's laboratory and the dozens of laboratories around the world that followed his work were based on that measure. And so what Lindsley, Og Lindsley did, who was a graduate student, he got his PhD with, with um, Skinner, and then he was a mentor of mine for 30 years. What he did is he brought that variable, count per minute, into the classroom, originally with teachers, regular teachers of kids and special ed teachers. And so, for example, if I asked you, if I gave you a piece of paper that had like 120 simple addition problems, like three plus seven, one plus two, like that, and I said, I'm going to give you a minute, let's see how many you could do. 
as a competent adult, you would probably be able to get someplace between about 60 and maybe 100, 110 correct a minute. And you might make an error or two because you're moving real fast, but that's, that's competent range of performance. Now, our education system doesn't even look at that. It looks at percent correct only. And when you look at percent correct, you can't, I tell you, we've got data, you can't tell a difference between the performance of a severely disabled person who maybe gets 100% correct at eight a minute and a competent person with a PhD who probably gets 100% correct at 110 a minute. You can't even see it. So we brought that into the corporate training world with formal practice, short timings, one minute, two minutes, half minute bursts uh, so that you don't have fatigue. And what we're looking for, the definition of fluency in sort of technical terms originally was accuracy plus speed. It's how many correct versus incorrect in what period of time. So we can talk about count per minute of corrects and errors. But not everything has to be done real fast. So, for example, when I'm talking to somebody in a sales or customer service environment, it's not that we want to talk real fast. I tend to talk too fast myself sometimes. But we want to talk at an appropriate pace, a smooth, comfortable, confident pace at the same pace as we'd probably talk about our mother or whatever. And we want to do it, say correct, the right stuff. So you can think about it as quality plus pace. You can also think about it as doing the right thing without hesitation. So somebody asks me about some information in my account using this, using the customer service rep without even thinking about it. I can go find that and tell them, I don't have to say, Oh, where do I find that man? You know, which is unfortunately all too common. So, Fluency is the notion of, of practicing until it's useful and quick and second nature. And sometimes we practice the sort of super fluency. So, for example, when those two people are, are working as a pair and they're looking stuff up and confirming whether they got it right or not, they're probably looking it up faster than what they would have to in the job. But it's just like sight reading. If I can read words at 200 words a minute, I can slow down and read with great expression. But if I can only read at 80 words a minute, I'm just stumbling through it. And the same thing applies to anything else, whether it's playing a musical instrument, using a system, having a sales conversation, talking to people, in a t you know, whatever it is. So we look at the time dimension is really what it comes down to. Thank you for that. David, do we have any other questions? Yeah, I've got a, yeah, uh, another question, Carl, because what, what you're describing there, um, and when you were unpacking the ATT example there, you talked about um, uh, uh, different solutions there to help you get to the outcome. Now, we know that, that a lot of stakeholders have a fixed view of what a solution might look like. And in the absence of being able to um, uh, sell them a known solution at the um, mm -hmm. consulting stage sometimes they get nervous uh, you know so so wait so so you know if you were to say um, well maybe this isn't a course maybe this is something else we'll do they'll get jittery and ask well if it's not a course what will it be and if and sometimes I could in a consultant might say well we don't know yet till we've done the analysis which creates even more anxiety oh, yeah. mm -hmm. what advice would you give to a consultant at that stage yeah, that's a good. That's a really good question. I like the word jittery. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's a couple things. I confess that for my whole career, from really when I was working with teachers even to now, I'm almost always working with what marketing people would call early adopters or innovators. People who are just going to do the same old thing the same way they always do as a checkbox probably are not going to be my clients. And I would argue that they probably aren't going to be the clients of a lot of our performance improvement colleagues unless you're coming in with quality or process as your thing, because people understand that that's, about, you know, that's not just learning and development, but um, um, a couple things. One is in my selling to people, literally as an external consultant, we're always emphasizing our differentiators and our research base. So in the fluency world, when I could say, when I had a company called Product Knowledge Systems, and we, we worked on major product launches for companies like Microsoft and Genentech and big companies all over the world. And when I went into those folks, I would say, look, if you look at the way you normally do uh, a, a product training, there's some things that are we need to improve. One of them is that product knowledge is often about features and benefits. And then you tell your salespeople they're supposed to be identifying needs and offering solutions. So we should be teaching needs and solutions. That's the first thing. What do we get fluent at? Second thing is 
usually salespeople are overloaded by too much information in the wrong format that's hard to use. So we're going to use the information mapping method, which is a systematic, user-tested, research-based way to make documentation easy to find and use. Third, um, uh, your people aren't fluent, and you need fluency in face-to-face -face conversation. So we're going to give you these practice activities that can be started in a classroom setting, but can be practiced on in the field and even in conversations with your, your field managers so that people actually get fluent on stuff. And I think there was another one. But the point is, if you tell people that, it's actually like what people talk about now is the challenger sale. People realize, oh, you're right. I never thought about it that way, but we do have those problems. So that's what I used to do in the sales world. Nowadays, I say, uh, look, you're coming in and I know training, you're not getting the ROI you want. You know, you're doing this training and then people say, wait a minute, they can't do it. You know, I've had clients. I had a client, oh, some years ago, a, a healthcare company, and they had people who were in customer service, billing, and uh, I think collections. And the training department would train them, and they'd go back to the wherever they were working, and the managers would say, these people aren't trained. we got to retrain them. So we looked at the jobs more carefully, and we identified their actual work outputs instead of generically teaching them to use their systems and generically teaching them customer service skills, whatever that means. And we got focused on being able to produce the solutions, the changes in billing, the negotiated payment deals, whatever it was, and worked like a charm. But um, so, so, so what we need to do, I think, is inform our, our if we're internal, our stakeholders, we have to sort of say, this is a little bit different. We're, we want to partner with you around the performance of your people. We don't want to parachute in and do something to them and go away and, and hope for the best. And so it doesn't always work. But when I, you know, most of what I do now is I train performance consultants and then coach them through projects. And a lot of the work we do is to help people make that connection with their stakeholders. So the stakeholders say, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. Let's see what, how that goes. Now, a lot of times there's bumps in the road but that's the direction we're trying to take. And I don't know if that addresses your question, but that's how we approach it. Yeah, absolutely does. Thanks, Carl. Do we have anything else? Um, the, the only other thing that we've got outstanding, um, uh, Guy, is a question on um, uh, whether we, uh, somebody could buy your T-shirt. Uh, so I think we need to set up a merch, uh, a merch stand or, uh, or part of the website. We we have a T-shirt we want to make, by the way. It's it's Gilbert's equation, which is the worth of an intervention equals uh, the value of the accomplishments divided by the but divided by the cost of the behavior. And the subtitle, which my colleague John Scan came up with, was nobody wants to be the denominator. So we want to make a <laughs> we want to make that T-shirt for our next summer institute. Sorry, but I had to say that. Well, let me let me bring us to a kind of a close here. But uh, so, Carl, what what guidance or advice or suggestions would you have for the members of our audience and and who are going to look at this uh, uh, asynchronously afterwards? How can they start climbing the learning curve, the performance curve uh, regarding your approach to these? Well, uh, of course. Yeah, fair enough. So first thing is there's a bunch of free stuff. And, and performancethinking.tv is our YouTube channel. We've got like 23 webinars on that now, and we've added a new one, and we've got some sort. You can learn a lot from that. There are people who are saying, hey, you're giving it away for free, and that's not quite true. But there's a lot to be learned there depending on what your interests are. So that's one thing. As well as on our website, performancethinking.com, which has a, some white papers and some publications and like that. And, you know, I've tried to follow in your footsteps of making some information available, but I'll never keep up with you, man. But anyway, so we've got a lot of free stuff. But, of course, I can't not offer our programs. And we have two sets of them. We have our Performance Thinking Practitioner Program, which we do an open version of every few months. And if you go to the website, you can find information about that. And that teaches people each of these components and gives them practice on interviewing people for outputs and defining criteria and all that. And we then coach people through a project in their environment that we, and, and so that's a way, that's a pretty good way to learn this stuff and to wrestle it to the ground. And we've, we called in often 
we not only do the open program, but we also do it inside of companies where we got a team of people who want to make the shift from training and development to performance consulting. And then we also have uh, our leadership and management coaching programs. And the coaching program applies this very same approach. It's just that I'm talking with you. And our first conversation, if I'm coaching you, is to identify your customers and work outputs and then say, what should we work on? Like, is any of these need improvement or uh, for the next project or for your career path? And so we pick an output and we have a conversation about it and we engage in how the six boxes stuff is working or not. And then we have some agreed upon action steps and we do it again in a week or two. And so the idea is ongoing development of people with an accomplishment focus. So I can't help but say, we think the best way to come on board with this is to go through our programs, but there's a lot of free stuff on the YouTube channel. So start there is what I would suggest. So I, I'll, I'll make it a note here that you didn't say, uh, point people to Gilbert's uh, book, Human Competence, which I found to be a very tough read back in 1979. It took me three times to get through it, but I think that that's, you know, it, it, it was all great stuff once I finally uh, absorbed it and learned, uh, from others like Joe Harless and you and and many many other people, uh, 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 David, uh, let's let's wrap this thing up. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Guy, and uh, and thank you so much, Carl. That was uh, that was so enlightening. We've uh, we've had a really engaged group. Um, we might not have had a lot of questions, but we had a lot of comments uh, telling us uh, how much people were were getting from this. Uh, so uh, so thank you. It's been hugely valuable. Uh, and thank you for attending too, and for your for your contributions. Uh, via the magic of digital technology, you'll receive a copy of the recording uh, very shortly after we wrap up today. Uh, so uh, why not be a good friend or colleague uh, and share this with uh, with folks you know who uh, you think that this could be valuable to uh, as well. Uh, and please do remember to join us in two weeks time. Uh, we have uh, a special offer. We have two for the price of one, uh, two guests. Uh, Timu and Frederick from uh, Telia in Stockholm, uh, who have done some incredible work uh, and could talk about uh, about the work that they're doing currently at Telia, the pivot they've done very recently, and the uh, the, the gains that they've been able to make in a very short amount of time. Uh, it, it, it will be compelling uh, viewing and listening. I can promise you that. Uh, but it's all left for, for us to say is uh, is thank you very much again, uh, and we'll look forward to uh, you joining us next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.